From In the Beginning to the Musical Apocalypse, this is The Bible Says What. I'm your host, Mike Wiseman. Whipping Jesus, nailing his hands and feet to a wooden cross, crucified and left to die. Why? Why did he have to go through the pain of death? Because his father required it. Without his death, Yahweh would condemn the entire human race. Why? Because a man named Adam, who lacked the knowledge of good and evil, right from wrong, did something Yahweh found to be condemning. This one act of defiance brought about a force known as sin. Sin is the reason Yahweh now needs death and bloodshed. Instead of wiping out sin and evil, Yahweh decided to allow it to run rampant. The Christian deity refuses to take control. He will not stop sin or the devil until until the end of his pointless, played-out drama. Why? Because this is how he wants it to be. It's all for him. We are here to serve his wishes and commands. Our purpose is servitude. I, for one, do not want to be a servant to anyone, especially the documented child killer Christians worship. I do not want to be a slave or entertainment or a pawn for some egotistical madman with a selfish plan. Let's start the show. Is there anything in the Bible that you yourself have an issue with? <laughs> okay, so it took you reading the Bible to realize that those things were bad for you? Yeah, it actually did. I, I didn't figure I, this out on your own? No, Ted, Ted Bundy could be redeemed. God doesn't kill children. Does, what, what do you think the Passover was? Yahweh sets up a whole system in the Old Testament where you slaughter animals just so he's able to forgive you. Today's special okay. guest is former pastor and army chaplain and the author of Journey into Wholeness, Bob Searle. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, uh so much, Michael. Thank you. It's a privilege to be on today. So is this your first podcast, Bob? This is, well, I had, um, I had one on, uh, last Wednesday, Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Bob on, on his uh, podcast. So, um, so this is, this is actually my second one. Well, how fun. I'm I'm so excited to have you, Bob. So I kind of wanted to just briefly have you explain your book to us and then we'll, we'll jump into the questions from there. Sound good? Sounds very good. Awesome. Very good. So I wrote this back in 1998, 1999, not intending it to be a book at all. Um, I was doing a uh, CV, CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education reg- um, Residency at the Duke University Medical Center. And one of the things there, after 20 years of ministry, I thought it would be a good idea to go back and continue to re- refine my tools, but also mm. to reflect upon my spiritual ex- experiences and the various uh, streams that of of uh, spirituality that had a, had a really influenced me so i spent a time uh in our final project I, I wrapped this up into a final project and and wrote uh journey into wholeness at the time i didn't have that name at all hmm. and uh so i completed the the work and uh resumed my pastoral ministry i'm a va chaplain out of the canandaigua va and uh, Mayor Kolpaz, who worked at the Center of Excellence at uh, Canandaigua, was very interested in chaplaincy, spirituality, faith, and uh, suicidal ideation. Hmm. And uh, at the time, I was working with uh, the veterans on the drug and alcohol unit. And one of the things I started to do with them was uh, the prayer form, Alexia Divina. It's a very old prayer form, has its Jewish roots, moves in the the Christian, and so I was using that with our veterans, and then had them journal afterwards their spiritual movements. Hmm. And I said to Merrick one day, I said, Merrick, I, I know this is affecting them, and I said, that probably in two cents maybe will get you a cup of coffee. Is there any way that we possibly can quantify this? Because in in the world of EA and in the world of uh, science, um, uh, probably what I would say would be an opinion to some. So he developed a way, and we actually, we actually 
uh, we're over a course of a, a year. Uh, we, when the veterans come in, we give them a, a spiritual assessment. Uh, part of that is uh, the Duke University Religion Index Score that um, measures a person's spirituality. But the other huh. is the Berg Spiritual Injury Score. Now, the Berg Spiritual Injury Score was developed by Chaplain Berg, and uh, he was a. This is this has been um, uh, around for a lot of years, Michael. So he, he identifies spiritual injuries as guilt, shame, uh, anger, resentment, grief, meaninglessness, hopelessness, a feeling that God or life has treated us unfairly, and and uh, the last one is worries about our fears, death. So. Uh, we, we put that under a scrutiny of, of a way to find out. The question was, does this help the veterans at all? And what we found was is that if a veteran in a, this particular prayer group would use Lectio Divina, we found that the, the, the guilt and shame and the other spiritual injuries would begin to lessen. So that was huge. And in part of the Lectio Divina actually um, – talks a little bit uh, toward the end about the dark night. We don't get into that a lot with the veterans, although I do think some have experienced the dark night, of course, uh, given some of their experience. I know um, previous uh, parishioners have done the same. So I show, I said, you know, I wrote about a little bit about dark night uh, when I was doing my project uh, what about 20 years ago or so. Hmm. And I said, would you like to take a look at it? And, uh, he said, yeah, sure. So I, I gave it, and he read. He said, Bobby, you got to get this published. <laughs> I said, well, it was intended to be published, Merrick. I just was, he said, no, I, he said, no, I think this would be helpful for, for folks. So that's, it was never, ever intended <clears throat> to, uh, to be in book form. But uh, here it is, and, uh, of course, the whole a point of it is, um, as Merrick would say, would be if it's something that can be of benefit and can help others, then then um, it's been worthwhile to put it out in press. Wow, that's quite a thing. <clears throat> There's a lot there. Let me let me start with um, just to, just some understanding on, uh, uh, of where you you come from. What is uh, what does spiritual mean to you? Well. I know there's a big discussion about religion, spiritual, and that sort of thing. Uh, my background is um, United Methodist, and uh, I, I was mentioning this on the other uh, podcast. Uh, hmm. In high school, in the United Methodist Church, there's uh, what is called uh, confirmation. And I went to my parents, and I said, well, pastor uh, is giving a, a confirmation class, and uh, should I attend it? Now, my parents um, had both gone through the Depression, so they were, mm -hmm. they were uh, kind of no-nonsense people. And so my mom said, uh, do you mean it? Uh, meaning to say, do you mean, uh, will I take my commitment to our Lord seriously? And I said, no. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't at that point. And so they said, well, don't do it, because if you can't make a commitment and keep your word, that was key in our home then uh, don't do it. So hmm. I went to college, hmm. and this is uh, late 60s, early 70s, and uh, there's a guy named Rick, Campus Crusade for Christ. You know, I hated to see this guy hmm. coming toward me because I know what he was going to do. He's going to ask me <laughs> questions. And uh, so one day he pops a question. He said, uh, Bob, are you a Christian? And I said, um, well, I go to church. That's the best I could come up with. Hmm. And he said, that's not what I ask you. I said, have you received uh, our Lord as our, our, your Savior um, and Master? And I said, no, I have not done that. So long story short, after a, mm -hmm. a number of various experiences, I did receive our Lord. So spirituality for me personally means uh, a commitment uh, to Jesus as Lord and Savior. We're right uh, starting Holy Week with Palm Sunday yesterday. I love Holy Week. Just love Holy Week in terms of the emotional, mental hmm. uh, following of the Lord to the cross and uh, his crucifixion for us. So, um, now, spiritual. Sorry, Bob, you're getting off a little bit there. So the spiritual to you is commitment? Is it, is that yeah, to me, getting? spiritual to me would not be a, a fuzzy word. Mm -hmm. It would be a very clear um, commitment to our Lord 
uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So like, um, and the good... kind of equivalent to the, the, the circumcisions of old, which you're kind of getting at here, right? The spiritual, this is your new commitment to Yahweh, your new, your, your new yeah. show of, of uh, loyalty type thing. Yeah, it would, it would be a, a circumcision of the heart. Gotcha, um, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Where over time we we grow in faith and hopefully experience more and more on a habitual pre, uh, basis the presence of the Lord uh, working within us. Yes. Now I have to take that into a setting, however, hmm. in which we're um, very veteran veteran centered, and so I have to start where the veteran is. I, it, it's we can't impose ourselves, of course, on others. However, however. Uh, most of um, my veterans that I serve are either Protestant or Roman Catholic. Huh. Uh, so I listen to their story and then enter into their story and try to help them discern how it is that God is moving their life. Because um, at least on the veteran side of the house and civilian in the parishes, I think people deep down want to know, uh, am I loved? Am I forgiven? Hmm. And what can I give my, uh, my life to, uh, to someone that's going to make a difference in my life? <clears throat> um so spiritual growth to you would be a growth in this this commitment to uh to Jesus essentially right uh correct yes yeah. so when i make a commitment that's a beginning i may have had a, a very strong religious experience or i may not have uh but once i make that commitment uh my whole life now is focused on uh growing into the love of god and the love of neighbor and self, as, as Jesus would would say, the two great commandments. So that's our lifelong project, really. That's our focus. That's our hope um, that we grow in that way. So, okay. So we're growing in the spirit. So the spirit, spiritual stuff is not like a, a, you can't see like a physical manifestation of, of, of something. It's, 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 a, it's more of a commitment, correct? Yeah. In, in the Christian faith, of course, that would be um, the commitment uh, to our Lord. Um, however, uh, there's a growth that's involved. And what I try to lay out in the book is um, a pathway that has been historically um, talked about, written about by various folks, and how that can inform us today. Uh, because sometimes I think, uh, at least uh, in my own journey, Sometimes I feel like I've been throwing a real curveball. I don't understand it. Hmm. Um, and it's really made me ponder and wonder and even doubt sometimes uh, my, my faith. Interesting. Uh, yet, uh, in, in terms of the whole story of our, our Christian faith, it's very much a part of, of how we grow, I guess we would say, in sanctification, in love of God, neighbor, and self. So where does I really want to get back to those curveballs here, but but first off, I, I, I want to touch on that. <laughs> How does the Holy Spirit fit in with the spiritual for you? So for Holy Spirit, um, of course, we come to faith by Holy Spirit taking us to the cross, uh, seeing the love between the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Holy Spirit constantly is leading and guiding and directing us, and so like Paul. Uh, we learn how to walk according to the Spirit. That is key because we want to uh, discern well, we want to choose well, we want to uh, essentially show our commitment through uh, doing the Lord's will in mm. our life. So um, the Holy Spirit now becomes uh, an intimate uh, person that constantly uh, moves us into the mystery of the love between Father and Son it allows us to uh, experience their fullness of love for us. Hmm. <clears throat> so the spirit, the spiritual, uh, or the Holy Spirit, is an actual physical entity you can feel and, and see and, and 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 whatnot. So Holy Spirit um, is is both and I think I, I we see the Holy Spirit working in in the body, of course. In other people, uh, we see him historically working. Um, we like, what do you mean working? Sorry, uh, what, what do you mean working in people? Oh, okay, so when I go to church, um, there are some old saints of the church that lived the life of faith for a very long time. Uh, I can see in them the likeness of who Christ is uh, because their characteristics, 
um, their fruits of the spirit are, are everywhere evident. Um, and so they manifest the life of who Jesus is. And, uh, and we're attracted to people like that because hmm. they've experienced the ups and downs of life and have remained faithful. Um, so we, we see that visibly, of course. Uh, we see it visibly uh, in the work of Jesus through the uh, Holy Spirit during uh, Holy Week, for example. So Holy Spirit uh, is always taking us to those places that Jesus went. Uh, for example, um, the Passover meal, the crucifixion, the resurrection. He brings it into the present so that becomes very real to us. It's not just a memory anymore. It's a living uh, part of our faith that we constantly, uh, I think, experience uh, ever deeper every every year as we go through the Christian year. Um, so, so was there an Old Testament, or sorry, was there a Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? For instance, the flood. Um, would it not have been more uh, miraculous or, or loving or caring if, if Yahweh had sent down the Holy Spirit to influence people, to change people's minds, to, to make them better, in, in your words here? Just would you think that would be a, a more beneficial thing to do? Or do you think Yahweh did that? and something else happened. What, what's your thoughts on that? So um, from a Christian point of view, Father, Son, Holy Spirit has always existed. That's our faith statement. And so therefore has always been present and manifesting itself in, in a variety of ways. I, I suppose we would identify the work of the Spirit uh, in, in the Old Testament in many different ways, but uh, certainly with the kings uh, and with the prophets, hmm. um, Yes, and um, with the giving of the law, I, I think Holy Spirit's involved in in all of that. Um, uh, mm. Certainly, in, in creation, uh, creating something out of nothing, uh, bringing order out of chaos, uh, which is reflected again in the prologue to John. So, uh, did, in the beginning, sorry, did the Holy Spirit mm. create the the world and and and, and whatnot, or did Yahweh do it? Well, uh, again, from a, a Christian point of view, it would be always the Trinity, Father, so Son, both. Holy Spirit. Oh, so all three of them did. So Jesus was there and creating the waters and, and the and the trees and planting them there and whatnot. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I would necessarily put it that way, huh. uh, but certainly um, throughout Old and New Testament, I think what we're seeing is a revelation of the um, the the love between the Father and Son. So we have this unconditional, ongoing development of what it is to be in relationship with God. Mm. And that, that call to God is always into his loving presence. Um, and so uh, part of that was, of course, giving the law so we could do the will of God and live in, live in his presence. And then, of course, with the, Old Test with the New Testament, rather, with Paul, it's using the law as a means by which we enter even further into the grace of uh, and mercy of God through um, the crucifixion, our forgiveness, and then the resurrection to new life that promises that will be restored and and transformed. Which part of the Old Testament law do you find good? Hmm. Uh, well, of course, growing up with the Ten Commandments was always, you know, the first part focusing the love of God and love of neighbor. That hmm. love of God and love of neighbors is consistent throughout the Old Testament. And when Jesus talks about that in the New well, Testament, he's actually quoting. Well, I mean, in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, let's get your slaves from your neighbor, let's kill our neighbor, let's slaughter their livestock and their children. There's a lot of that as well. I don't see too much love your neighbor. I mean, Hosea 9, uh, he, <laughs> he slaughters the people of Ephraim. And then you mentioned the Passover. Oh, my goodness. They did not love their neighbor in that one. The, the Israelites had to put uh, blood over their thing, and Yahweh went through the town and killed all the firstborn kids. That's such a horrible thing. Yeah. I, I don't see that as love your neighbor at all. Um, yeah. and, and the Passover story in general is such a horrible, horrific thing. And I don't understand how people celebrate it, honestly. If you think about it, it, why, first off, great questions, why would Yahweh need bloodshed over the doors to know which house is not to go in? I mean, he should know already, right? 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> just, these are his people. <laughs> I mean, if Yahweh doesn't know yeah. his own people, can't distinguish them from the, the Egyptians. I mean, yeah, oh, there's a lot of problems there. <laughs> then, and then the whole loving aspect versus coming down and killing the firstborn. I just don't see it. Yeah, um, yeah but, that is very tough. It's very tough. I think um, in my reflection on that, of course, the, the blood hmm. uh, is going to anticipate hate uh, jesus blood it's kind of a foreshadow it's weird though uh, I, I hear that a lot but these people mm-hmm. who put the goat's blood or lamb's blood i can't remember mm-hmm. which one it was i think it was lamb yeah. uh over their their doorways never met jesus yeah. none of them right not once not even heard the name jesus or mary or joseph or or any of those people so why mm-hmm. even bother teaching these people teaching them i guess or, or foreshadowing with these people about blood of Jesus that they're never even going to meet or, or need mm. or you know of, you know? Right. Well, of course, they would have, right. Right. Uh, but of course they would have not have known that um, at that point. So we have a progressive revelation going on from the Old to New Testament. Right. And it's very, it's very difficult, very difficult. I think you're absolutely correct to reconcile uh, some of the things that happen in, in the Old Testament hmm. uh, and, and reconcile that with. And, and so oftentimes we'll get the questions in the parish and other places about, well, are we talking about two gods? Hmm. Uh, they just seem to be different altogether. And yet there, I, I do think there is that silver lining of, of how uh, God can t- is uh, consistently uh, revealing himself. We have to remember in, in the Old Testament, uh, when Moses uh, was given the Ten Commandments, uh, this was a new law. Hmm. This was not something that had ever been given. And so it was very important because uh, through the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes, what we're finding here is a new work, uh, a new creation that is being uh, established. And so as a result of that, um, I'm not God, So, but I suppose that in establishing this, and because it was so important for the salvation of the whole world, blessed to be a blessing, that were, there, there were certain measures or things that were done that are incomprehensible. I can't answer all those questions. Yeah. There's a lot, man. Well, I mean, a lot. And that, that was half my yeah. issue. Well, not half. Well, a lot of my issue uh, when I went back and read mm-hmm. the Bible was a lot of these things I just yeah. couldn't justify. And you, you mentioned the Ten Commandments. Yeah. The first time Moses came down... Uh, he broke them because mm-hmm. the people were worshiping another or, or worshiping the golden calf. Well, what was God's punishment yeah. for that? Do you remember God's punishment to the people? Mm-hmm. He had mm-hmm. them strap yeah, swords to their sides and run back and forth and kill each other. I mean, I know. Yeah. Whoa, dude. Very, <laughs> yeah. That's a bit much. Very difficult to reconcile. Yeah. And yet, you know, over time, as I've read the Bible, hmm. uh, Michael, I've had to. Um, when I've come to these impasses in, in terms of my own understanding, mm-hmm. um, at times uh, I've had to let that go a little bit, mm-hmm. a little bit, not to stop reflection, because it's not about my expectations in the end. Uh, it's about how God is, is moving us to a, um, moving us by faith into um, a, a relationship with him. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's not always going to happen as we read scripture or in our own personal lives in a way that we think it should happen. Uh, because what happens is, is that then I'm at, I'm at the center then. Hmm. So now I'm behind the word and I'm making judgments about things that perhaps I possibly don't understand, can't understand. Um, hmm. and, and yet it's, it's, it's there. So I, I have personally, I have to be a little careful with my expectations and how I see things, because um, I'm not going uh, to see things in in terms of God's overall purpose and direction. It, for for me I, too, I, you know, I struggle with that. Uh, yeah. Those are very difficult. Direct, and and some people get stuck there. They really do get stuck, and 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 so to move beyond that becomes almost impossibility uh, sometimes, uh, except through prayer and of course the con constant work of God's grace. Hmm. But when I get to those places to get unstuck, mm-hmm. I have to withdraw myself. I have to limit myself and say, okay, I don't understand that. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, well, I, don't understand. I understand doing that. I understand, you know, trying trying to, 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 to bypass it or whatnot, but there's so much. And that was my issue. There's just too much to, 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 to try and justify. Uh, and you mentioned earlier mm-hmm. on uh, spiritual injuries, I believe it was. And there were guilt, shame, anger, resentment, and a few others. Um, yes, yes. Now, these are... Some of these are, I, I feel, are attributes of, of Yahweh, uh, characteristics, anger. He gets angry. He, he destroys things. He floods things. He, he slaughters children. He, he drowns them. He, he starves them. Uh, he sends wild animals after them. He gets angry. Uh, even Jesus got angry. He got angry at the, at the fig tree. He got angry at the, the money changers. Um, so, mm-hmm. And then resentment. Yahweh resents a couple things in the Bible, uh, pe- making people, for one, with the flood, uh, he he resents making Saul king, I believe it was, and then these are all what you would call spiritual injuries. So when Yahweh has these these characteristics, are they not spiritual injuries? Yeah, the the way we understand uh, moral injury, spiritual moral injury, is a little bit different than that. This is really consequences of a fall. So when I'm I'm uh, alienated from God, I've for whatever reason, I can feel guilt and shame. Um, I can feel angry or resentment. I can feel grief and um, the other ones that I mentioned. So this this comes really out of our um, lack of relationship with God, and uh, they um, they affect us profoundly. That's why Cha- Chaplain Berg put uh, as a goal of listing those to move uh, a person back into to reconciliation with God, neighbor, and self. Um, so it was not so much to, to describe the attributes of God, but really just describe those injuries that profoundly uh, affect us, that wound our human spirit, and um, is in need of great healing uh, by God's grace. So so what happens in, in your mind when, when these characteristics belong to Yahweh? This this perfect loving being, anger resentment. What, uh, uh, I'm not quite understanding your question. My, when when these these well, injuries how, are a part. Of, how does it work for you when Yahweh has these characteristics? This anger, the resentment, all that, the jealousy for crying out loud. You know, he he, he claims to be a jealous God. These are petty human emotions. These are petty human characteristics. Well, how does that work for you when Yahweh has these characteristics? attributes yeah um well i don't think of god that way first of all um you don't think he's jealous think angry that, and resentful uh i wouldn't put him an anthropomorphic that way because that makes him more like a greek and roman god hmm. um hmm. i would yeah. yeah i would i would more i would more characterize him as uh, someone that demonstrates his um um, the power and the um, wisdom and goodness of who God is. Uh, because remember, um, I have to remind myself hmm. always that God is of a different category than us. He's, he is a creator. He participates. He's in, intimately involved in his creation, but he's not a part of it. He's not the same category. So therefore, um, when we think of God, therefore, we're already limited and hindered by uh, how we experience life and then can very well project that onto who God is. But I think historically and how we uh, can experience God in our, in our journey of sanctification is uh, that he really is a God of power. He does make something out of nothing. He does bring <laughs> order out of chaos. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, but and, he does get angry, though, mm-hmm. right? Do, do you believe he gets angry? Uh, I guess I would have to understand, um, wrathful. Does he get wrathful? I mean, the old Testament, new Testament, it's all about wrath. The wrath belongs to Yahweh. Yahweh's wrathful. Beware of Yahweh's wrath. Uh, Jesus came to stop Yahweh's wrath. Jesus was a ransom yeah. to, <laughs> to the world. And, yeah. Uh, you got, you got a whole bunch of atonement theories that deal with that wrath and, uh, focusing upon the, the sacrifice of, I mean, we haven't got one understanding of, of atonement becoming at one with God. Uh, one certainly deals with God's wrath and how Jesus absorbs that and uh, gives 
instead of wrath, he gives us love. And I think that that is the message that uh, in the church is the one. I, the, the, you know, we can we can scare people into faith by God's wrath, or 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 we can say, oh, but the Father gave His Son, and He gave His Son to take on what we might have taken on if there hadn't been a cross. And so this is a profound, just a profound movement, how the Father, Son, Holy Spirit actually absorb the anger of God and yields to us and gives us his love. That's what's healing for, for example, for guilt and, and shame. If I'm feeling guilty or even shameful about something, absorb the then anger. that's what, yeah, I mean. So, yeah, so well, you admit, first we, off, you admit that he's angry. We, we got that part. Right? He's angry. He I'm wrathful. not sure in the under, way you understand, but go ahead. So in order to stop, and you said in order to stop this wrath, Jesus needs to stand in the way and absorb the wrath for us. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's, that's yeah. pretty... I don't know how else to understand the wrathful anger part of that. Yeah. Well, it's there's a number of uh, atonement... I think you're aware of those. Uh, the various... Um, but it does deal with God's anger in in those uh, in 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 what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So in so for example on the cross. Mm -hmm. So on so on the cross, uh, Jesus uh, Jesus willingly yielded himself in obedience to the to the Father. Uh, there was a lot of choices he he had. Uh -huh. uh, he could have in anger said. Um, I'm not doing this. I'm just not doing this. I am the son of God, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. And I'm really ticked off. That's what's going on here. I'll just wipe people off uh, the face of the earth. Or I'll, I'll start a new life with a... Well, he'll do that later. But no, he... he <laughs> right, right. No, he... But he said, <laughs> no. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so what we find is in the heart of, of the father losing his son... And uh, being able to accept uh, that love relationship between the Father and Son, what we get in the Holy Spirit then, uh, is not his wrath. What we do get is his love that draws us into his passion for us. It's a real work that the Lord does on Holy Week for us, of course. So it's like... And so that work is... It, it, it's, it's ongoing. It's like the anger goes through Yahweh, or sorry, the anger from Yahweh goes through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and it comes out filtered as love. Is that what I'm getting here? <laughs> well, uh, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it's sort of, Michael, but uh, uh, I, I think from from um, a trin Trinitarian point of view, it's it's not a channeling it's it's a description of how deeply father son and holy spirit love each other so when we see the son we see the father when we see the father we see it's that sort of transparency hmm. so really what we're seeing on on the cross is the heart of god <laughs> and the heart of god is is one that yields himself uh restricts himself limits himself from wrath to yield his love and I think that's a profound movement because when we experience that personally in Holy Spirit, we begin to realize what an incredible work that is in our life because we do find it healing and we do find us coming to wholeness. Why all the theatrics? Why the cross? Why the bloodshed? Why all the spirit, wrathful, turning to love? Why all this stuff? Why not just forgive people? Why not just, I don't know, Reveal yourself, all of the above. Why well, play out this, this pointless drama, you know, where we're going to go to the end and then Jesus is finally going to come back and then destroy the earth? Uh, what, what's he waiting for? Why didn't he just do it then? Why did he have to, you know, there's a lot of why, you know? It just doesn't make a whole well, lot of sense yeah, to me. Well, yeah, of course a lot of why. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, I would not take it as drama. Um, this is not a production for our Lord. Hmm. Uh, but this is uh, an ongoing way to reveal himself. And um, it's taken a while. I mean, why not just come down and be like, hey, here I am, as opposed to Jesus in the <laughs> Middle East way back when, when there's no cell phones or typewriters, you know. I mean, holy no, cow. No, no, <laughs> come down know, in 2020, man. 
<laughs> so I think I think for God, this is not going to be a one and done. It's not going to be a drive through through McDonald's. It's not going to be that. Uh-huh. Um, and, and why God chose to do that? Uh, that's a good question. I can't answer that. Yeah. Of but what I can uh, what I can answer, and what I do know, mm-hmm. uh, is uh, through this Holy Week and what uh, our Lord has done for us is deeply moving. It takes stony hearts. And it melts them. It takes uh, doubt and dissipates it. Hmm. Uh, because when we're at the f- uh, foot of the cross and we do see that blood and we know that it was shed for us, it, it just it, it changes us. Does it, does it remove all the questions? Absolutely not. Are there going to be a lot of whys? Yeah, of yeah. course. But I still know that I know that I know that uh, Lord and Holy Spirit is bring me to the cross to see him there and realize that father and son are yielding themselves to us in a, in a very powerful wise and a, and a very good way. So why did Jesus have to die? Well, we can uh, look at it a couple ways, I suppose. Um, one is that in the old Testament, of course, there was the, uh, um, with a tent of meeting and finally with, with a temple in Jerusalem, we have blood sacrifice, mm-hmm. blood uh, representing life. And so when sacrifices were taken to the temple, that sacrifice of the blood's animal, of course, was taking the place of the person presenting. Well, let's go back the, then. Um, why, why sacrifice animals to begin with? Why start the whole sacrificial system to start with? I mean, aren't there other gods that have sacrificial systems? Why borrow from them? Why not have something a little more unique that's uh, less bloody, less violent? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, if you're a god of love, I mean, it seems kind of weird that you would want bloodshed, uh, that you would, you would require people to kill something to you. You know, yeah. Well, uh, again, um, I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure God would work according to I would like to have him work. But I think that hmm. um, in the Old and New Testament, we see that sin is taken very, very seriously. Uh, uh, sin does leave us uh, lead us into to death of ourself. Uh, we become very self destructive. Um, and so in the Old Testament, we're seeing the uh, ramifications of disobedience. And perhaps one way of showing that, uh, necessarily not borrowing from other people, but demonstrating that when we deal with uh, God that is not of the same category of our existence, that the blood means life, of course, mm-hmm. and that when we sin, we actually are taking away that life. So uh, Mm. it can very well be uh, the emphasis of the seriousness of sin. We don't talk uh, much about that necessarily. Uh, I know um, uh, years ago at the Menager Foundation, uh, it's an old book now, Whatever Became a Sin, um, one of the managers wrote that. And he said, you know, it's interesting. He was a he was also not only a great clinician, of course, but he also a Christian man. But he said, you know, we, we've moved that out of our, our vocabulary and to our detriment hmm. um, because we can reshape, we can reform, uh, we can reframe a lot of our experiences, but they're all kind of a kaleidoscope of the ways in, in which uh, sin affect us. Um, and 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 we can and we can make good progress, but it doesn't restore and, and transform us. And I think that ultimately, ultimately, what uh, our Lord would like to lead us to is being restored and transformed. Our Lord is the only one that does that, actually. Uh, so, um, being restored and transformed into a new life, into a new creation, uh, Paul. That that's a that's a miraculous that is simply a miraculous movement in our life to be changed. Well, I mean, um, he should have done that a while ago, before the flood and 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 before slaughtering whole <laughs> cities of children and whatnot. Uh, but you, you've mentioned well, you sin a minute. I, I do. 
Yeah, what are you up to? Man. Uh, oh man, we'll yeah. get well. We could get into that. I mean, you you seem yeah. to you you have a communication with him. I don't. He doesn't seem to answer me. I mean, maybe you could ask him for me. Uh, oh, he is. Oh, <laughs> I'm just saying, man. He don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, come on now. <laughs> uh, We're going to have to talk to the mind, Mike. This is <laughs> <laughs> sin. What what is sin to you? So, uh sin would be not demonstrating um love of God neighbor and self. It would be harming self, harming neighbor. It would be uh harming neighbors. Not participating Hmm. I mean, say again, Michael. You said harming neighbors. Not, harming harming yeah, self, if, harming if, neighbors would be sinful. Well, sure. If 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 our if the two great commandments, if we want to hold that up as our standard, growing to love God, neighbor, and self, uh-huh. uh, and that's what it is to live in God's presence. Uh, to sin would be the very opposite of that. So, see, this is, this is where I have a problem. When God tells okay. the Israelites to go kill their neighbor, it's okay. Mm-hmm. But if somebody goes and kills their neighbor, it's a sin. Why is it not a sin when Yahweh instructs people to kill their neighbors and not love them? Or when he refuses to send down the Holy Spirit and change hearts and minds? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that, Michael. But I do one. know uh, that, yeah, I probably don't... Um, because the juxtaposition of God's grace and mercy and how he has uh, interacted with his people throughout history is, is uh, baffling, to say the least, hmm. um, truly baffling. And, uh, well, God uh, in the Old Testament is very much concerned about forming um, a new community, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm-hmm. And demonstrating how he wants his people to live in that context, and then in, encountering others that are um, absolutely opposed to that and want to destroy uh, the Hebrew people uh, because of their belief. Uh-huh. It's very much different than other beliefs. Um, um, I mean, still, I mean, I, I hear about prison. What is it? Prison. Uh... Prison church or whatever they call it. Prison ministries, there it is. You know, changing yeah, hearts and great. minds of, of these cold-hearted killers all the time. Uh, you know, yeah. why, I don't hear that in the Old Testament. I hear Yahweh going, yeah, just go kill them. They won't listen to me. Or even his own people. <laughs> I'm going to send wild animals to kill your kids because you're not listening to me. Or when he sells sells them into slavery because they won't listen to him. I mean, it's just like, yeah. where's the hearts and mind changing then? Why is it so much yeah. more you know, said in the New Testament anyways. It, it's, it's very confusing. Yeah. Um, but it you, is. So but there's, there's, there's sin is here. There's a lot of grace and mercy. Sin is here because of the original sin, correct? Adam and Eve and whatnot. And at the end of the days, do you believe that Yahweh is going to destroy sin? Oh, I think he already is doing that. What, how That's is he already... doing it and why is he doing it so slowly? <laughs> you keep wanting me to pu- keep wanting me to push God along here. So, um, <laughs> so uh, on the cross, we say that uh, the cross, hmm. uh, what actually happened, was uh, Jesus uh, conquered sin, evil, and death. And so, when we participate in this uh, wonderful grace and mercy and continue to focus and live in his presence, we're actually finding that um, old sins are not as powerful and begin to, uh, by God's grace, begin to be uh, washed away and actually living in that. We find that death is uh, no longer um, the, uh, the enemy. It is now a doorway to eternal life. Hmm. And uh, so we, we don't, we find ourselves now because of that gracious work within us, not going from sin to sin and then entering into the mystery of evil. But now we find ourselves moving uh, toward our Lord and responding to his grace um, within us. And, and I think that's one of the reasons I, I spent a lot of time with 
with constellation and desolation in the book because um, oftentimes those are difficult to discern. But what uh, I think our Lord does call us to discern is how is it that God works in our lives? How can we how can we know that? Well, one way we know it is that we're being pulled out of ourselves, out of our egocentric world, and into uh, the new kingdom that's being created within us, huh. and we find our our we find our treasure is really uh, within us as we have received our Lord, and that that now is what what matters, and is our focus and vocation for our life, mm-hmm. and to. Um, by God's grace, continue and hopefully reflect the likeness of Jesus. I, we don't always do that perfectly. I know I don't do that perfectly. Well, where's the uh, sin, but sin I, eradication I, part coming? So he already eradicated sin at the cross, and there's no more sin? Or there's still sin, but it doesn't affect us the same? I, I'm, I'm a little confused. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is confusing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> so um, when we receive our Lord and uh, we know that we're forgiven, that gives us the motivation, the yearning, the desire to live in that. Does that mean I'm now sinless? Does that mean I'll never have to deal with sin uh, again? Well, no, that's um, hmm. because by the time I've come to the cross, uh, I've, I've marred the image of God with that pretty severely, pretty severely. There's a lot of wounds there. And uh, for some people, some people, uh, a few people, those are are resolved very quickly. For others like myself, it's taking a lifetime. It's taking a lifetime. I know when I first received Christ in my junior, summer of my junior year in college, the the scripture that uh, became mine was Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Of course, that's that's Paul's uh, prayer to the Ephesians. It's our prayer for us that we may know the width the length and the height of god's love i'm not even there i'm not even there i i i I grow in it and i know uh that allows me to continue to deal with sin in my life um but i'm not there um and uh in our wesleyan tradition uh, john wesley would say something like this we're on our way to perfection not a state of perfection necessarily, but we're on our way. Hmm. So perfection, growing in God's love, was always a part thing. That's what he meant. It's yeah. a part thing. It's I, a part thing. I, I, I try so, to do a little better every day as well, but I don't. I don't need. Um, I don't. I don't use Yahweh for that process. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, just before we go, I, I wanted to go all the way back to those curveballs. And those doubts of yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just want, I was very curious if, if you know, is, is there anything in the Bible that you struggle with? Any, any stories or, or what was it that uh, threw those curveballs at you? So the, the curveballs um, um, that I mentioned in the book, uh, Dark Night of, of Sense and Spirit. So um, the Dark Night of Sense occurs, uh, occurred uh, with me, and historically it helps. Uh, uh, happens with people that they really have been faithful. Have they have well ordered lives? Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means they're getting up, doing their devotion. They're going to church. Um, they're going to a Bible study, and this has all been wonderful. It's been great, and it's fed them. And then, hmm. uh, kind of hit the wall. Uh, devotion that nuts doesn't feed quite so much. Worship, my mind is. It's kind of drifting and have the greatest preacher in the world, but uh, I'm not sure it's really. And the Bible study, oh, it's a yawner. And so uh, the question becomes, why? Yeah, you know, I've, I've been faithful. How, how, how in this, how in the world can this happen? Well, we, we go into, and it's called dark because it is dark. Uh, we don't understand why. We don't understand what's occurring with us. But uh, these have been called the kiss of Christ. That is to say, this is a way for God to heighten our desire huh. to go uh, to grow uh, more continually, and and it makes sense in, in in this way, Michael. Is that if I thought that I had a a lifetime plan on how to follow God to be completely faithful, it would be my plan. But if if God is the God of 
of our creation and is always restoring and transforming me. I can't always know what that way is because I'm not God. So um, what a dark night does is allow us to become even more radically dependent, even more uh, um, being able to surrender on a daily basis. So uh, not always sending understand. you these doubts and these, these curveballs? Well, I, you know, I, I think you I, you see that in the Old Testament. I love Psalm 139. Um, I think it's around verse 9, 10, 11, 12, right in there, where it says, um, even if I'm in the darkness, even if I'm in the darkness, that is like light to you, O Lord. Um, I, I love that. I, I'll use that with parishioners and, and our, our veterans because uh, the psalm speaks of an intimate knowledge of us, and it speaks of a darkness that can uh, overcome us. Huh. Uh, and yet the hope is, is that that light is not darkness to, to God. That, that, that's, that's light. But he uses what we perceive as darkness as moving us ever closer uh, into him so that we can... Uh, Okay, so Yah- sorry, Yahweh sends you this darkness so that you will doubt or, or whatever, so that you'll be closer to him? It's not so much he sends it, it's, it's we grow into it. So, so he allows uh, it to again, happen. Uh, correct. Okay. Yes, uh, I would say. So, so who sends so the darkness, growing- though? Where, where does this idea come from? Is it, is it Satan or is it Yahweh? I mean, who's influencing this decision? Well, again, if, if we're going to think of God's love as beyond our comprehension in which we participate, um, I will faithfully, as I, as I have experienced the love, I will faithfully desire that and want to be in union with God and want to, to obey him. But it's, it, it, it takes a long time for us to die to ourselves, to our false e- uh, ego. Hmm. So I'm going, I'm going to do that myself. I'm going to uh, have myself uh, at the center thinking, well, this is what it is to be faithful. Okay, um, I've received Christ. I, I know he's forgiven me, but I still, I'm limited. I have to be limited because I'm human. So I'm going to move into a darkness that was um, that can, I'm not going to expect it because I think I'm doing the right thing from my perspective, right? So... Uh, but what, what happens, I think, is we hit the wall because we come to the end of our own understanding hmm. of what it is to be faithful. Because um, I, I'm not going to experience all of who God is in this lifetime. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, blowing new life into dust. is quite a project. It's going from the infinite to the finite. Well, it should be pretty uh, easy so this, for Yahweh. I mean, everything, you just snap his fingers and it's done. He, I mean, he spoke and things came into existence. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if it happened that quickly, we would think it would be us anyway. So, <laughs> I mean, if the guy um, wants to have a relationship with you and all, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like there's a better way to do it. And you talk, speak of relationship and communication and, and all of these things with Yahweh, yet he's actually not there communicating physically or or showing up at your birthday party or going out to eat with you or going out and have a cup of coffee. I mean, he's not actually that kind of relationship. It's a special kind of relationship, correct? Well, yeah, it's a both and. Uh, he is at our birthday party um, Well, uh, through the ones who... He's not and, eating cake or uh, nothing. So we, <laughs> I mean, we're not. We're not <laughs> no, he's not anybody's plus well, one or nothing. There, you know, he's, we don't have to save a seat yeah, for him. Well, That's I'm what I'm be, talking about. You yeah, know, yeah. Well, I'm at a birthday party, Michael. I'm going to be eating cake. I love cake. So, <laughs> um, uh, so um, it's not Jesus, but it's Jesus present. I'm still present there, and he's he's around the table. Hmm. He's he's at, the Lord's everywhere. <laughs> so it's really. I don't think it's a both and actually. Yeah, well, I'm talking like physical here. Like, I have a relationship with my wife, my kids, my parents, my my brothers and sisters, and my friends and whatnot. That's a relationship. I can call them up on the phone and have a conversation. I can FaceTime. I can, I can send them things. They can send me things. 
But when you when it comes to mm-hmm. the relationship with Yahweh or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, that's completely different because none of these these people, these entities, can be seen, heard, felt, touched, or tasted. It's different, right? and 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 the relationship part of it is way different because at this point, you're having a relationship with an invisible person, and to me, that's a lot different. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. It's it's. Uh visible in fact that we did see jesus but invisible in that that that's still present to us in holy spirit well i've and never right, seen it jesus is a different, it's, you've never seen jesus i'm sorry i said i've never seen jesus you've never seen jesus as far as you know i know right i mean he hasn't oh, shown up well, for you and... that, mm, well mm, that's where the inspiration of scripture comes in when we read i mean we don't but holy spirit doesn't holy spirit then in the inspired word, uh, bring scripture into the present. Hmm. And so uh, he, he, we don't see him as he walked, but we see him as he walked uh, because uh, the scripture calls us deeper and deeper and deeper into its meaning for us. Um, and so we see him, but we don't see him. Hmm. And it's the same way around the birthday table. We see him, but we don't see him. Or it's the a, effects of him, thing. like he's not eating cake, you know what I mean? It's not like a little pieces <laughs> nibbled out of the cake where he was sitting or nothing. Yeah. Well, of course not. Of yeah. course not. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I appreciate that, Bob. I appreciate your time today, Bob. Um, go ahead. Yeah. We, we're we're out of time you. here, so go ahead and plug that book one last time for us. Tell us where to find it. Okay. So it's uh, Journey into to Wholeness, and uh, you can find it on Amazon, and I believe... Cokesbury has it now, so you can find it either way. And um, I try to explain that in it uh, those dark times in our lives when we feel God has abandoned us, but he's actually bringing us closer, and hopefully it will be a help for, for people. It, it's a book that needs it's – a, it's a very short book, so it needs to be uh, read very slowly, and I would suggest prayerfully that's the way it was written. Hmm. So, Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Have an awesome day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's all the podcast there is for you today. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard and want to help keep the recording light on, simply go to patreon.com forward slash BSW the podcast and sign up to be a supporter of the show. Your episodic tithes of a dollar or more will give you access to the patron feed, unaired conversations, early access to each episode, and much more. For the latest events, BSW swag, and a peek behind the scenes, head over to the show's ever evolving webpage at the Bible says what.com. Thanks to the cosmic powers of the internet, it is now possible to buy me a beer or coffee online. Simply go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash BSW the podcast and click the appropriate buttons. If you can't support the show monetarily, please like, share, and or leave a review. As always, you can find me at the Bible Says What Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram pages. You can also reach me at bswthepodcast at gmail.com. And no matter which platform you use to listen to your podcasts, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on the next episode. Until then, would you kindly pick up your Bibles and read them? I'm gonna go now. Is it okay? Oh, you're waiting. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> Baby, what? I thought I was listening for you because you're like, okay, you're ready. So I'm like, all right. So you were recording, and I thought you were waiting for my feedback. So I was like, okay, it was something about your voice. I appreciate the feedback, honey. Dang. All right. I'm gonna go now. Good day. You ready? Enjoy. Here we go. You ready now? Yes, bye. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, we should speak up. Say something next time. I don't know.